Done. Like, I'll start meeting. And I was like, wait. Handled at a later meeting. East Central Towns' public comment rules will apply for all public comment. You must be a resident or business owner in the township to speak. You must identify yourself by name and address before speaking and sign the guest log for meeting minute purposes or follow the chat procedure already discussed for Zoom attendance. Comment is limited to three minutes. It must be about the agenda item being discussed with the exception of public comment and the meeting for non-agenda items. No action will be taken during the public comment period for non-agenda items and all issues will be referred to staff. So now we move on to our first item on the agenda. Please rise for a moment of silence and the pledge. Now the pledge. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Maybe see it. <laughs> Tonight we have a, a couple public items at the beginning of our agenda before we get into our regular agenda items. The first item we have is a tequila Mexican grill at 205 Rosetown Road. It's a request for a liquor license transfer and I'll turn it over to our solicitor to go over the proceedings. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is gonna be a public hearing on the request for an intermunicipal transfer of a liquor license. Um, before we begin, I would just like to ask Mrs. Schweitzer, was the notice of tonight's hearing properly advertised and was the property posted? Yes to both. Okay, thank you. Um, when we begin, we'll have the applicant come forward. Um, I understand they are represented by council. Um, the applicant or council will be sworn in and present um, their proposed operations. Um, there will be an opportunity then for questions by the board. And at that point, you should open it up also for public comment to see if there's any questions or concerns that need to be raised. Um, at the end of the hearing, um, you do have before you a resolution that you can consider adopting this evening. All right. Okay, so. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening. May it please Mr. Chairman and members of this honorable board of supervisors. I am Steve C. Nicholas, attorney for the applicant, Tequila Mexican Grill Bakery and Store LLC, a Pennsylvania limited liability company. Mem uh, the members of the applicant company are Cicely Karen Ramirez Martinez and her brother, Gerardo Azial Ramirez Martinez. And they're present this evening. Uh, in the middle here is their mother. Uh, the company trades under the name Tequila Mexican Grill Bakery and Store at 805A Roarstown Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601. The restaurant has been in operation at this location since October 10th of 2020. I wish to thank you for giving your, us your valuable time to allow our presentation regarding the resolution before you. I also wish to thank the township manager Schweitzer and her staff for the courtesies that are extended to anyone who visits a township. I would be remiss if I did not also thank your solicitor uh, for her prompt responses to all my inquiries. I believe it is helpful when I give this presentation to give you a little background of the enactment of the Pennsylvania Liquor Code. The sale of alcohol is, has been subject to two amendments to the United States Constitution. Prohibition began in the United States with the ratification of the 18th Amendment on January 16, 1990, and ended with the ratification of the 21st Amendment on December 5th, 1933. All matters related to the sale of alcohol uh, were generally left to the discretion of the states and the, and the, the Pennsylvania Liquor Code was enacted on November 29, 1933 to be effective with the ratification of the 21st Amendment. The Liquor Code has been amended and reenacted on several occasions. When first uh, enacted the liquor code established a quota system for residents in each municip municipality. Uh, you were permitted to have one license for every three, for every 1,000 inhabitants in the municipality. 
over the years, the quota system has been amended two times. Each amendment reduced the number of licenses that were available for issue by the, the Liquor Control Board. The first amendment changed the number available uh, in the municipality to one license for every 2,000 inhabitants. Today, it permits the issue of one license for every 3,000 inhabitants. However, now it's countywide instead of just a municipality. Due to the quota restrictions, there are no retail restaurant liquor licenses generally available for purchase from the Liquor Control Board. And if you're looking for a retail license, you need to find a willing seller. Uh, the question, the licensing question currently issued for use is located in East Donegal Township. The seller and buyer are not related. This request is made pursuant to Pennsylvania Act number 141 as amended, which took effect on February 19, 2001. The act drastically changed the license quota system from the municipal oriented quota system to the countywide quota, uh, quota system. This change was made to enable continued, continuous business development in the municipalities. Prior, prior to the uh, amendment uh, in Act 141, a license with very few exceptions could not be transferred outside the boundaries of the municipality to which it was originally uh, issued. The current law permits the transfer of the license from one municipality in the county to another municipality, which is a two set step process. The first step is our appearance before you this evening to get your approval to make application to the Liquor Control Board uh, to file, to get, bring the license into uh, East Hanfield Township. Uh, and if you approve our request, your approval is not the approval for the transfer of the liquor license. It's only approving uh, our ability to file our application with the Liquor Board. Uh, the second step of the process consists of filing our actual transfer application with the Liquor Control Board uh, and posting this notice, which remains posted during the entire application process. You probably have seen this poster before. But uh, it remains posted until the liquor board says you can have a license or you can't have a license. Uh, the building during the second step, the liquor control board conducts a very stringent investigation to ensure, first of all, that the building in which the license will be placed meets all the requirements of the liquor code. Uh, the liquor code requires uh, premises to be licensed to have 400 square feet. That includes a service area, preparation area, storage areas, whatever you have. Uh, and that storage uh, footage of this location is 1800 square feet. So we, uh, we, we passed that uh, instance. The second uh, Requirement is that all individuals re associated with the liquor license must be persons of good moral character. Each applicant must pass through a thorough police background check. And uh, my clients have no arrest or conviction record or any criminal record. A license must be renewed every two years and Every two years, the individuals associated with the liquor license are, must pass that standard again and again. Uh, and the third step is that the applicant must exhibit uh, the financial ability to conduct its business. My client has occupied this pr premises since October 2020 by way of a lease agreement. At that time, when my client uh, Per, uh, lease the building, 
Uh, they made extensive renovations to the property, purchased new fixtures and equipment and cleaned up the place. At this time, the, my client is only purchasing the liquor license and uh, there is seller financing involved. Uh, he, my client has the necessary funds to complete this project. After liquor board issues a license to this location, uh, the business undergoes scrutiny, uh, it continues. A business licensed by the liquor board is probably the most scrutinized business in Pennsylvania. The Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement, which is a department of the Pennsylvania State Police, they're not associated with the Liquor Control Board, uh, has its sole purpose to ensure that the uh, licensee uh, operates the business uh, in a proper and lawful manager manner. I'm sorry. The Enforcement Bureau conducts both open investigations where they tell the licensee that they're in the prop, in, a bit, in the, in the uh, location, uh, and, and they also conduct undercover investigations. The undercover inspections are the most prevalent. By law, uh, the, the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement is required to investigate every complaint that's filed. Uh, I've been practicing this area of the law for 54 years, and uh, a good number of the complaints are usually called in uh, because a disgruntled person has been refused service. Uh, and those complaints turn out to be unfounded. However, the Bureau of Liquor Control Enforcement must investigate each complaint. The minimum fine for a major violation of the liquor code is $1,000. Uh, an example of a major uh, violation is service to someone, service of alcohol to someone who is under the age of 21. Uh, but the judges have over the years stepped up. And so the minimum fine that anyone can expect for a major violation it's not $1,000, but it starts at $1,750. And if you get too many uh, violations, uh, you, it could result in the revocation of the liquor license. Um, the license before you this evening uh, permits the sale of all alcoholic beverages, which can be sold in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. The restaurant has 65 seating for 65 patrons with on-site parking for 18 vehicles. The liquor code does not require any parking areas and uh, the minimum uh, patrons that can be served is 30. So uh, this restaurant meets that uh, requirement. This restaurant offers a full range of excellently prepared salads, soup, steaks, chicken and seafood, all prepared with a traditional Mexican flavor. This is a place where the entire family can enjoy a well-prepared, reasonably placed meal with good service in a pleasant atmosphere. The hours of operation currently are Sunday, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m., Friday and Saturday, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. The premises are currently closed on Monday. Uh, those hours may change over the period of time. Uh, this will be a no smoking establishment and it's a place where uh, alcohol will be served only for the convenience of the patrons that uh, come into the place. This style of restaurant uh, is not conducive to your normal corner barroom atmosphere. If you want this at type of atmosphere, you have to go somewhere else. Uh, effective as of October 1, 2021 of this year, only the full-time manager who's approved by the Liquor Control Board is required to be RAMP trained. RAMP is an acronym for Responsible Alcohol Management Program. 
there is no requirement under the liquor code that alcohol servers be ramp trained. A condition at this premise <coughs> will be that they must be ramp trained and certified, which is a voluntary program that teaches the server of alcohol how to make the correct determination whether or not someone uh, should be served or not. Uh, it, it teaches you to observe if someone may have consumed too much alcohol and what action should be taken if that uh, uh, should, should occur. It also teaches uh, the licensees the newest tricks devised by the underage buyers, uh, persons who are trying to be served alcohol, uh, and they're, they're quite up, uh, quite a few. Uh, this will not be ad op operated as a nightclub and therefore will not create problems for the township that such uh, operations might generate. My client has a good and successful business in East Hempfield Township and assures you that this <clears throat> business will continue to operate under the strict provisions of the law. We respectfully request that you approve the rest resolution before you this evening. And I thank you for your time and patience. Are there any questions? Before we get into the questions, it would be helpful to have one of your clients be sworn in and confirm that they agree with all of your statements that you've made about the operations. <laughs> Wanna ask her, just for our record, why don't you go ahead and ask her the question? <laughs> Are you going to ask her the question? Okay. Yes. You should ask your client the question. You heard uh, my speech this evening. Uh, is that generally correct? Yeah. You do. Ours are to none. Ours is to, to oh, none. Okay. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the hours are 11 a.m. to 6 to 9, 9 p.m. Okay. So any questions of the board? I have none. No. Okay. Any questions from the audience? It's going to be a quick hearing. Um, so we have no questions of the board, no questions of the audience. That basically now the step would be to close the hearing. Close the hearing, correct. Is there anything that would prohibit us from actually taking action? No. Since they are present here they tonight. They are here. You can go ahead be respectful of their time. So with that, we will uh, close this hearing. I have I'll entertain a motion to close. So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Wigglesworth. Do we have a second? Second. Second for Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Now the resolution before us is, I'll read it out loud. It's for resolution 2021-51. And the motion is to approve resolution 2021-51 Align a transfer to liquor license to North. I guess it's kind of weird. That's got to be a typo. Allowing the transfer of the liquor, liquor license to 205A Wordstown Road in East Hempfield Township. So do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay, motion from Mr. Bennett. Do I hear a second? Second. Second from Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Thank you. Congratulations. Good luck. All the best. We'll now move on to our next public hearing. This is for a zoning amendment, ordinance amendment. It's related to the permitted, special exception, and conditional uses. Um, and we also have Lancaster County Planning Commission comments and David Miller's responses. So again, I will turn this over to our solicitor to open up the hearing. Okay, this is a public hearing to receive comments on the proposed ordinance amendments. Um, I can tell you that notice of tonight's hearing was advertised in LMP on November 29th and December 6, 2021. Um, so you can certainly begin by um, taking comments uh, or introduction from staff and if there are any questions uh, from the board. Otherwise, then you should open it up to the public to see if there's any comments uh, about the proposed amendments to the ordinance. Okay, so we will start off with the uh, the board itself. Uh, we did get 
uh, maybe it'd probably be good maybe to have our engineer just go over the planning commission comments first and then we go into board discussion so as a beef um brief background we uh, came up with a text amendment that was made in an effort to streamline some of the existing uses within the township and then also a review of about eight to ten years of zoning hearing board cases was undertaken and um, each request was kind of tallied just to see overall what are the common requests going to the board and what conditions are commonly imposed upon them upon approval and also which requests were being denied um, and then also taking all that into account a draft was created and um, that is what became the ordinance that we're speaking about this evening and also included in a few of those changes are um, a list of ongoing issues perhaps that were in East Tenfield that staff had collaborated all their thoughts into and also um, they kind of just tracks maybe some small edits that needed to be made to the text um, just kind of just minor edits for reading and for clarity so those pieces were compiled into the amendment and we can talk about the planning commission meeting responses if that's what you were referring to we can uh, touch on those um, that would be I, helpful because we don't have that in our packet. So if you can okay, review I, I, I believe there is a member of the planning commission here, so I I can try my best to grab that, or um, if you you know obviously add anything or or speak to that. Um, I believe if we kind of just go through the ordinance as proposed, uh, the it's on page two of the proposed document a junkyard has been defined and i believe with that there was some concern about what is uh, included in that including timing for a vehicle being stored on a property that may be out of inspection or registration and also just the idea that a vehicle that is classified as disabled via this text would in essence not be allowed to be stored on a proper uh, property specifically would then be classified as a junkyard. Does that clarify? Well, okay. So the response we had to that and through speaking with staff was that the intent of this is to define that use which does not currently exist within the ordinance. So it's allowing the staff to be able to have something very specific that you could refer to a junkyard as where in the past it was kind of open to interpretation so it allows that it also allows them to use that as a tool if there is a property in east Hemfield that perhaps is um, becoming a nuisance property or an issue this gives a little bit more teeth to be able to show that that use is not permitted um, where it's located and also, um, if a use were to come through to be proposed, the zoning hearing board would have something to compare to or use also to define that use rather than it being open to interpretation or anybody's input. So that was the goal of, of that piece. Um, and again, if, if Julie has anything to add, most certainly we can do it at the end or we can do it as we go. Let's, let's get your part okay. first and then we can... And I believe after that, there was a comment about um, what is currently in the ordinance called uh, accessory dwelling units. That use exists uh, throughout the ordinance and is currently, um, you would have to go to the zoning hearing board for approval to um, construct that use on a property, which basically is an additional dwelling unit for a family member and allows them to live on the property, but it is tied to someone who would be related to the inhabitants of the structure or the property. So through all the cases that we reviewed, um, this was the highest um, request, if you will, or the most often requested use that went to the zoning hearing board and the conditions that were typical upon approval were basically things that related to the unit not being uh, allowed, if you will, to be rented to anybody who's not family. So 
that part of the ordinance, I think, was a kind of an issue with a few planning commission members that they were hoping perhaps that it would be expanded to be more of a rental unit in general and not tied to being used only by someone who would be um, considered a family member of the owner and the inhabitant of the structure. And I think with that, um, there was a thought there that the township was trying their best to streamline a process and add conditions that would be used almost like a checklist when a permit would come through rather than sending that to the zoning hearing board and having it be a costly and timely process. So that was the intent of that change per um, discussions with staff throughout that process. But I believe the main issue that was discussed was related to the, you know, in the end, if that user no longer inhabited that structure, the individual would have to give up that extra unit or have another person who met the criteria basically move into there. So if it was a, a, a mom and a dad lived there and an uncle could still come in after that, but it couldn't be rented out to anybody that didn't fit that criteria. And I believe that was the main issue discussed at the meeting. And the other, the other one, I don't think we ever actually, I think you brought it up, but I'm not sure we talked about it. I believe you said there was an issue with like a timing or outdoor seating related to restaurants. Was that one that it was brought up, but we didn't actually go into much detail. And then there was then kind of, if we're just going through the ordinance, the, the other one was, I think the parking of vehicles that would be tied to a vehicle leasing or repair area within the right of way or a certain amount of feet from the right of way. And I believe we spoke about existing conditions on certain properties. This new text would in essence um, cause multiple lots, existing lots to be not able to do what they're doing if this was enacted. And I think our response to that was a lot of those uses are existing. It would be looked at as existing and would not be subject to the new criteria if that use were to expire, change or go away and then hope to come back, they would have to meet the current code unless relief was granted through uh, the zoning hearing board like any other variance request. And I believe those are the comments I was aware of. Is that fair? Is there? Okay. Mrs. Will, you'll have to go to the microphone. Sorry. I just wait. Just want, we're going to give you a second. So uh, that's, and then how about the County Planning Commission comments? Sure. So we um, received two comments from County Planning. One was related to the cluster change from five acres to 15. <laughs> and I believe their comment there was um, they like to see higher density, obviously. So, so that one was, was pretty clear. Our response to that was there was a few instances within East Tenfield where um, you know we kind of overview and look at remaining pieces of land, uh, maybe some of the ones that fit the criteria with the smaller number didn't necessarily meet the use that a cluster tries to aim for, which is to utilize um, like open space or areas that would be classified highly or like environmental areas and try to cluster in essence properties on that. So when that review was done, the higher acreage seemed to be a better answer to what's left in East Thamesfield. And the other comment was tied to uh, community rehab uses within residential zones, which is currently permitted in the ordinance through review and discussion with staff and the committees that went through this text. It was deemed that those uses perhaps are not compatible with the uses in each of those zones and therefore it, they were removed from low density and medium density, but it still is permitted in your enterprise zone. So it's still allowed in the township. It was just deemed that perhaps it's not compatible with existing uses in the other two zones where it's located or um, permitted now. I believe that captures the county's comments and the responses that were provided to them. Um, and I believe also, the other kind of um, approach to streamline and clarify the text within the ordinance is a high goal of the County Planning Commission. So there were a few notes in there that, um, you know, those were comments, but there were also other pieces that were noted that the ordinance does uh, comply or, um, you know, go along with their long-term planning goals in the county. Yeah. 
Any questions for our engineer at this point first? And then so um, just real quick on the accessory dwelling, um, if I understand you correctly, the the thought behind it was to streamline the process and allow residents not to have to go to the zoning hearing board. That's correct. So the existing text has conditions that you would have to meet to be approved. Um, and if you met them, you would be granted approval. Basically, uh, this text amendment doesn't change a uh, use. It just adds some of the components that were commonly found in an approval document that the board would give out. And, and of those, as an example, it would be um, at one point, the board required a document to be signed and notarized stating you will not rent this to anybody but the people you spoke about at the hearing or if it changes and there's another person who meets the criteria, you could rent it to them. That will be kept on um, at this office, it will be kept as a, you know, that would kind of be your proof. And then it changed to the, the, that the people would have to sign a document and then record that. And then that would go along with the property. And then anybody who would come into that property would have access to that public document, knowing the restrictions placed on that, that you're not allowed to rent anybody that doesn't meet that criteria. So this text pulled a few of those common recommendations and conditions into the ordinance and allowed the use to be a permit process basically, and would almost act like a checklist that you would have to provide all this documentation. But again, you're coming in applying for a permit and a quicker turnaround if you meet all of those conditions, rather than having to pay a fee and go to a hearing and um, you know go through that process. So it allows residents uh, a quicker and easier way Correct. To, to do the same thing. That's correct. We're not restricting it any further than what was already defined. The only thing that will be added to it is that we took the conditions that, that weren't in the ordinance that they had to record that document. That is a change, but who can use it and who can live there and the criteria in which you can be approved has not changed. So that's not a limiting of users. It's just adding that extra layer of protection to make sure that the individual who's applying meets the intent of that use, which was always limited to family. Okay. And then uh, just one last follow-up. So if someone wanted to um, have an accessory dwelling to somebody that's not related to them, are they still able to go to the zoning hearing board and seek relief? Correct. So you would, it depends where it would be located, but um, in essence, you would need a variance request perhaps for two dwelling units on a property. Um, and if you're in maybe like the um, village residential area or some of those spots, there are um, lot area requirements that would tie to a dwelling unit. So perhaps there are a few properties in those uh, specific areas where you could do that via land development plan and or stormwater plan or possibly a permit, depending on size of the lot. And in the research with the zoning hearing board decisions, were there any instances in which there was non-family members? Like was that? That's the, like that, that link to it is actually in the ordinance as as defined. So that, that use is limited to a family member to be able to even um, go for approval. That would be a key piece of even um, rising to that level just because it is tied to strictly those users. Okay. The family. Thank you. Any other questions to the board? Uh, just one quick question. Um, I see we've pretty well um, defined the accessory dwelling definition. Should we, uh, is, is family member defined within the ordinance? I, I don't know if it's specifically called out. I think the definition of a family will be in there, which was I think recently amended by the state, meaning what you, you could and could not uh, call a family. Um, and within the existing definition, we did add a line or two, but in the existing, it'll give examples in there, such as parents, grandparents, children, and grandchildren. So that 
there is a link there to what that could be and can be. So somewhere we can we can get back to exactly what we mean by by family member. Exactly. This this change of that went through a few iterations um, of changes, and I think in the end, ultimately, um, the existing text was left, and we added specifically what types of structures could be deemed um, okay to have this use. But you can go back and point to specifically what you would call a family and those individual users. Okay. Does that answer your question? I don't have the, the actual existing text in front of me, but I, I would think your definition of a family would be in there separate from this definition as well. Would that be something that the zoning hearing board could come before a zoning hearing board and they would have to make a decision on whether it's a family member or not? I guess if there was some question about it, yeah, you know, if, if, uh, the zoning officer perhaps did not give a permit to an individual and they would appeal or something that I guess that could be a process that could be an outcome. I think what maybe what you're asking is if they would go to them to ask for a variance to rent this to somebody who's not a family member, then they would have to show some sort of hardship on that. But I'm not sure they would well, again, argue that is a third cousin a family member. Just, I think by your you know, ordinance, it doesn't that's appear an extreme. so. I'm just saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think per what what's in there, I don't think that would. But somewhere there's qualify. You can work back to what a, correct what a family member is. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Uh, yeah. Um. On accessory dwelling again, I think just so I understand is you could possibly build an accessory dwelling and end up not being able to to have anyone occupy it. Is that correct? I mean, correct. It, yeah, I mean, I it's mean, a possibility yeah. you would you would be and that and that's an existing possibility now and you're paying a fee to go to the zoning hearing board in a process to to get that outcome and that's not, you know, that end result is not changing the intent of this was always to allow um, a user, but when you would come in and state that you know it would be your your mom would be moving into that unit. Um, it, I guess it'll be open to the zoning officer, whether you would need additional approvals if that were to change to your your aunt later, but I think as long as you're in that definition that, that we talked about, um, you know, it, it could be utilized by that individual um, as long as you meet the criteria, but as soon as you would, that use would expire perhaps, or that person would move away, in essence, you wouldn't be allowed to rent that unit to anybody who didn't meet what you testified to at the hearing or you know, currently at the hearing or what you had on your permit application. That's basically what that's how it is now. We just are tweaking the definition, I think. So and it, exactly like the, it is a, an outcome that you may have what you create into habitable space on your property that if you don't have anybody to utilize that that meets the criteria, then it, it, it would not be permitted to be rented to anybody at like a market rate kind of an approach that, that's good thanks i that that's was that's a good answer um for group home i see we're crossing out that group homes must be licensed by an appropriate government agency and the rest of that sentence is what was the reasoning behind that i um again this this portion was from an existing kind of list of changes to be imposed uh from staff and i believe the intent of this one was that I think the state has a new or revised definition of what that is or can be and how it can be regulated, I believe. And I believe this text just didn't agree with that. Okay, and I, that's also a good answer because I, I was involved with the zoning hearing board and I, it was a long time ago, but I remember a few things from that. And I think we did discuss it, we had to define it as the legal def, you know, as the state would require. And that that's kind of what I was thinking was the reason, but. I believe with this one too, as you see under the line after the uh, text that has the strike through, um, I think that's the key there is that you're, you're not permitted to treat them any differently than you would just a regular uh, right. single family dwelling. So I think the text above that was just going to be removed to avoid any issue with understanding what this is and how it's to be regulated. Okay. Um, and under junkyard, 
Um, it does say uh, used for storage outside a completely enclosed building, and then it lists those things which are not permitted outside, which means that you could have it inside a building. That's correct, I assume. Um, but I'm wondering, where is junkyard at an allowed use? Uh, are, there, are there any zones where junkyard is allowed as a use? So in, in your current ordinance, you, you won't find that use listed, whether it's permitted or a special exception or as a conditional use. Um, that, and that, that is a need, that's an existing part of the ordinance as well. Um, there, there is a qualifier in the ordinance that would allow for a use not provided for it to have a process to be uh, approved or reviewed. And that is partially why this text is being added to allow that end result or that, that hearing, if you will, to have something to say what a junkyard actually is that, that you've defined and is, is not defined by anybody or any other party. Doesn't our, uh, doesn't our zoning ordinance have a definition for a scrap yard, though? Recycling yard? I believe it, uh, yeah, it has a, a text. To, I, I believe that use is tied in the rural business zone. I believe it's a specific use that is identified and limited to rural business. But I think the intent here was to provide specifically what a junkyard is and it's something that, that you would you would define rather than have it come to you in that setting. Okay, and if, if a place or say a business that um, fixes cars, like a mechanic happens to have a car sitting outside, is that grandfathered? Or does that become a junkyard and then we have to tell them they have to, like I can picture a mechanic that we go to that has probably like a, a dirt track car, I think on their premises, mm -hmm. which has been there for a long time. Um, I'm wondering if this would require them to, you know, put it inside or get rid of it. So I think the use, it would depend on the actual use of the property. There are components to your ordinance that allows such areas that would do repairs to vehicles. And in there, there would be specific uh, time frame and criteria for and, and kind of an assumed um, process that it would take time to repair a vehicle. I think if that were to be prolonged and maybe a stacking up of, of those kind of vehicles, then I think the zoning officer would could interpret this to apply to a property like that if it's a chronic issue. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I like that whole idea. I mean, I understand there are properties that, that we've had people come in and complain about with multiple cars on them. And I think this, would very much help with that, but I believe for a, a business that in the job of repairing cars, I think I'd like to see some kind of an exception for at least, you know, one or two cars at least. That's just my thought. Mm -hmm. Any more discussions to the board? So I have a quick, uh, just I guess procedural question. If we wanted to make a change, um, what do we have to start all over again, or how does that work? We don't have to start over again, but we would have to re-advertise at okay. least ten days prior to enactment okay. if it's a substantial amendment. So if you're if you're talking about tweaking definitions, that's probably a substantial amendment that would have to be re-advertised. Okay. Just to go back to your last question, just one of the text amendments within this um, did relate to the motor vehicle kind of repair use that you described. And there is a uh, time period in there. This is on page eight. Um, there is a time period in there that would state that um, they have to, like a vehicle brought in would have to be in repair or in a state of active repair, at least within a period of roughly two months there, it would have to be shown that you're working on something and it's not just kind of on the site to be there permanently almost. So, that, I mean, there are, that's kind of what I was kind of getting at earlier, where there are places in the ordinance where these uses are accounted for and uh, some restrictions are placed where they may be 
more applicable to that specific use than a junkyard or accumulation of items that could be deemed a junkyard by the zoning officer. Okay, any more discussions of the board? Ms. Wills, the floor is yours. Having me, thanks for um, taking the time. I'm sure you reviewed my letter beforehand. Um, my primary objections, Mrs. Are, Will, if you could identify yourself. Sure, I'm Julie Will, 1909 Marietta Avenue. Um, and East Enfield Township Planning Commission member. Oh, also an East Enfield Township <laughs> Planning Commission member. Um, a relatively new one, so I missed some of the procedural. Um, my primary objections are the treatment of motor vehicles and how, you know, we kind of sort of classify either the vehicle storage. Um, there is the current storage amendment, and I think, or store, the ordinance relating to vehicle storage, and I sort of view this almost as doubling down on an ordinance that maybe isn't necessary or maybe is almost unfair to our residents who are interested in just, you know, practicing good stewardship and repairing their own vehicles on their own properties. Um, I sort of, you know, like, was mentioned um, per the ordinance, I guess junkyards are not permitted anywhere in the township, but if one vehicle would, one vehicle that's not currently operable or inspected, how I'm reading this is that that would be shown that you're using your property as a junkyard. If you have one car on your property that you're trying to fix up, whether for your personal, you know, daily transportation or just a fun car that you would wanna enjoy. Um, the other thing is, if you look at the proposed ordinance, uh, where are we, 270-5.2.00, um, they're proposing to add on specifically to motor vehicle sales, leasing and service facilities, add on that of um, all vehicles that have been brought in for service, maintenance or repair shall be in a state of active repair um, and shall not be permitted on the premises for a period of more than 60 days. So I'm not sure how, I don't know how much you talk to people in the automotive industry, but currently um, I'm sure you're aware that there's a supply chain issue um, across lots of different industries. The automotive industry in particular isn't, isn't immune from this. Um, I am close to a lot of people in the automotive industry and getting parts on time is tough, um, especially when you have like collision repair. Um, we have, you know, Dutch Valley in the township. Um, you know, other shops for different types of automotive repair. And that 60 days, um, sometimes a car is not drivable. If the lot can only have that on their property for 60 days, that's just not consistent with, with the reality of business. Um, so I just sort of view this as a burden um, to those. Um, so I guess largely that summarizes it. I just think that people should be able to to work on their own cars and their own property. And that also, you know, when you have professionals trying to work on cars, that the ordinance should sort of line up with the reality of business. Thank you. So I think I, I haven't weighed in yet, but I will comment that for most part, I agree with everything that you're stating. Um, the purpose of this ordinance was to simplify things. All these were things that were gone before as the hearing board, which was expensive. Uh, for residents and by getting it out of the zoning hearing board and just coming to township staff that cuts down a lot of costs for our businesses and our residents that was the overarching uh, issue and a lot of times what we do too is ordinances and at least the way we view ordinances are living and breathing documents we're, we're tweaking them and we make changes and then we make more changes and we make more changes we don't we don't try and get something perfect and we'd also don't like to have something just sit around and get real old too uh, we want to make, we're always willing to make updates or changes. Um, your comments about the accessory use is actually something I agree with. Um, that's, that's taking it to another level that hasn't been discussed yet in the township. Uh, but I do think that when somebody wants to rent out their property and they are living there, they should have the right to rent it out beyond just to a family person, especially when that, if they do it for a parent and that parent passes away or moves on, now they got this space that they can't use. And there's no reason why if they're living there, they can't rent out that to a college student or somebody else. So I, I kind of agree with a lot of your, your comments at this point. Um, I do agree with your motor vehicle comments. Um, 
I'm a little bit ambivalent right now in the junkyard thing because I've also, when I was a township manager, I dealt with people that would have 15 yard cars in their property. And that became problematic with the neighbors, big time. Um, so there is, there is some sort of a balancing act uh, between a person's property rights and their neighbor's property rights and not having all their property values go down because one person is maintaining their property as a junkyard. Uh, so I think we, we probably would need to look at that one a little tighter at this point. But the overall intent of this was to really simplify things, make it much more property owner, business owner friendly, get a lot of these things that are going to our zoning hearing board out and to just routine approvals at the township, which is saving. Typically, when you make an application zoning hearing board, you're, you got to pay for a lawyer, you got to pay for the application fee. You could be looking at three, $4,000 as a property owner to make a, that request or just, just to do a simple building permit. And are, are you referring to the comments about accessory dwelling or was were junkyard type comments going before the zoning hearing? The well? zoning hearing when it comes to junkyard, that gets a little bit more complicated. It, it would get, because it wasn't defined, stuff could go to zoning, depending on how the zoning officer would interpret enforcement. Uh, so it became a gray area. It's definitely something that needs to just be defined uh, so that everybody kind of knows what the ground rules are. Uh, but yeah, most of this stuff ends up, the reason we did this ordinance was we had a lot of stuff that was going to the zoning hearing board. We challenged our staff to give us a list of routine things that were going to the zoning hearing board that we could legislate out so they wouldn't have to go through a much more expensive process. And so that's what the, the overarching intent was originally was to, to simplify the process. So the accessory unit right now, that's how our zoning hearing board for years has been interpreting things. Any way a person could uh, create a second unit, living unit space as it had to be for an immediate family member. And then, and so our goal was to get that out of that process. And what was the role of the zoning hearing board in dealing with junkyard type complaints? That would be compliance. So if our zoning officer came up with a compliance issue and they disagreed with it, they would have a right to appeal to the zoning hearing board. And because nothing's defined, it becomes a very interpretational thing about one person's trash is another person's treasure, as some people like to say. So, and I think um, sort of the intent of my letter, I had also the current ordinance about outdoor vehicle storage does prohibit a lot of you know home vehicle repairs, and my suggestion as an alternate way of relieving some of the the workload on the zoning hearing board is perhaps being a little more forgiving in that ordinance and adjusting that ordinance rather than sort of doubling down on a narrow definition of what type of automotive work can be done on an individual property. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I think thank you also for your... just wrote, yeah. um, I think it was Mr. Weaver brought up that the repair of vehicles and things is not being prohibited with this text, you could still do those things. It just would require you to do it inside an enclosed structure. So, I mean, it's not as if you couldn't have a car that you'd be actively repairing or working on. It would just need to be inside of, in essence, a building or a structure, a garage, something. It just wouldn't be permitted to be, as it's written here, outside of a completely enclosed building. All right. That's one thing where I would agree with Ms. Willis, because actually I did use Dutch Valley and I had a car sit there for about 90 days plus before we had all these issues. So, she is technically correct. That would be, in my interpretation, a violation of our ordinance right now, as we got it currently worded. And we do have a one business in particular that does salvage and, and, and collision repair, and those vehicles do sit for a while. And it's an insurance claim alone could take 60 days for that vehicle sitting on before they even touch it. And I think with the addition of the other text in the later uh, part of the ordinance that was referred to as well, there, there is a qualifier in there that you, you will be able to show that you're you know, it, in a state of repair. So I think if, if perhaps it came up, that owner could show like, hey, you know, we were actively working to get this done. Uh, perhaps those documents come through and it's, you know, it's just asking for proof that it's, it's not just a stagnant thing that's just waiting or being stored there. In essence, if you could provide something I think that would be a reasonable thing for the zoning officer to use to meet that criteria that you you are showing that you're making efforts to do something and it's not just um, being placed there for storage forever long term. I, I think the are you talking about the current ordinance? No, it would be it, it, yeah, the, and the text and I think you referenced it. Um, I'm seeing an earlier rather than an or. 
And which one are you, are you, are you referring to 5200? Yeah. And, and which, which part are you referring to there? Like, I don't, correct me if I'm looking at this differently, but um, vehicle shall, so shall be in a state of active repair and shall not be permitted on the premises for more than 60 days. I would think if, I mean, I, I guess it's open to interpretation, but I would think if you could show that you were working on something, perhaps uh, stages of repair could be looked at that perhaps that clock would be set, you know, from a, it arrives and now it's under active repair, perhaps it starts you know, again, but it would be looked at rather than it being cut and dry. I would think there'd be some common sense, maybe a, a use to approach that as well. Um, but again, this, this text that you're referring, kind of looking at here with these two were added to allow this use to be permitted by right rather than having to go to zoning hearing. So a few of these things weren't just pulled out of the blue, they were commonly imposed on these uses. Again, you went and got your approval and then conditions were imposed upon you. So it, it is new to the ordinance, but it, it, it wasn't just something that was created um, to um, monitor these things. It was, it was being used. It's just now part of the ordinance again, so you could come in for a permit and be granted approval and go on your way rather than um, the process that was outlined by Mr. Russell earlier. I, I would probably on this one, I would kind of agree that maybe this part of our ordinance needs to be revised, a proposed ordinance, at least in my opinion. Um, all vehicles that have been brought in for service means of repair shall be in a state of active repair and shall not be permitted on the premise for more than 60 days. That's pretty prescriptive. It, it basically says that any vehicle brought in has to be out in 60 days on the premise, not whether it's indoor, outdoor, whatever the state must, must be. And if a mechanic wants to keep a vehicle on the inside his building for a year, I could care less personally. Um, but uh, this the way this is interpreted, I would interpret that they have 60 days to get out of there. Now I know our zoning officer is not gonna be going with a clock, look at, okay, that, built, that vehicle has been there 61 days, you're now in violation of, the, of our zoning ordinance. There would be uh, complaints and there'd be a lot more to it, but it just really does seem a little, a little heavier hand than what our intent was. I, I'm also, I think the same, because um, this can affect existing businesses. We want to be business friendly. I think this, I can picture at least two places where I suspect there are cars that sit out and uh, they are business owners um, that fix cars. So I would actually like to get maybe a little more input from some of the local repair shops just to see, do they have cars that are sitting out? Could they move them? I don't want to just pass something and then have a whole bunch of mechanics in here with a lot of issues, especially if they're working on my car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your, your car gets fixed. The other thing is, could there be something about screening, like no unscreened outdoor vehicles or junk? I mean, if you can't see it, is it really a problem? I think that's another possibility. So you, you brought up some questions. Uh, uh, the overall intent, our intent was to make the process simpler. This does do that. It sounds like we got a little, in my opinion, at least a little tweaking of one or two of the language items, but it depends on the whole board at this point. So any other questions of the board before we open up to the audience? Because I was treating Ms. Wills as a kind of an extension of staff by being a planning commission member. Just a question on accessory use uh, for my benefit. Why are we limited to family members? That's my question too. That's just the way the zoning hearing board has done it over the years. It's been a very onerous process. So we could mm -hmm. allow, so, okay. I, we could, I would just throw a little caution to, you know, when you're looking at low density residential and somebody wants to add an accessory dwelling, I mean, essentially you could have developments that could change over time by doing this if you don't limit it to family members. So in other words, your neighbor down the street wants to put an apartment in the back of his house and rent it out. Neighbor across the street wants to put in an apartment. You're talking increased traffic you're talking um, possibly a decrease in the value of your single family home because of that. So I would just be careful with that. 
and I, I would just be cautious with that um, change on that. And for clarity, that that use that we're speaking about, the what that is, what that means, and how it's interpreted is is not to be altered with with this. It's just the process in which you can be approved. That use was always tied to a family. It, it's not as if it's changing with this. That's just that's it, it had to be that, but it had to go to your zoning hearing board to be approved. Now it's it's still the same use. It's just um, allowed for um, a permit process and a few conditions that were already being imposed upon every case that came through. Um, as, as was stated, it's, it's uh, streamlined to be a permit review rather than a zoning hearing application uh, and process and then come in for your permit and uh, start construction. So I would say with the accessory dwelling, I'm, I'm actually happy with the language and what we've done here. I think it streams line the process and, you know, as parents move back in with their children, it allows for our residents to get to this point easier through what we've done here without going to the zoning hearing board. At the same time, we're not opening up neighborhoods to change drastically by allowing apartments to come in in single family um, residential um, developments. So it's a very minor change that, that is a convenience for the residents. And I, I'd like to see us head in that direction. With, I agree with everything that was said about the 275.2 with the motor vehicles, especially as this affects existing business. And the more I read it, I really do feel like we have to go back to the drawing board on that one. Um, you know, and, and take a look like, um, like Mr. Weaver had said, really, we should be talking to the, the people that do this business and making sure we're not creating um, a problem for them, um, which we could be doing. The junkyard um, definition, um, I think what it's trying to accomplish is in residential zones where we have probably people working on more than one or two cars or cars that have been there in disrepair for long periods of time. Maybe there's a way to do it better than what we have written here and maybe not make it so heavy handed. Um, and I'd be open to redoing that as well. Those are my comments. A question for our engineer real quick too. Accessory dwelling units back to the, the, the whole rental thing. Mm -hmm. Is that be would that be interpreted as one building or multiple buildings? Are you saying could you construct a structure? Separate is it a detached, detached structure or attached? Is it taking your house and modifying your house? It's either attached or as uh and it has to be it can't be another principal structure, but it could be another structure on the property, such as a detached garage or something could be on top. It could be apartment for somebody like that. Yes. So it could be attached or, or detached, okay. but Thanks. it couldn't be if the um, zoning officer looked at it as two principal buildings in the property that would no longer fit the definition. So by nature, it has to be. I mean, it, it can't be another home on the property in essence like a full blown home, if you will, it would have to be something less than what's there to even meet the definition for that I, I, accessory I, in nature by, by definition. I respectfully understand what you're saying. So we will sort by also and recognizing that we're as our generation that's might be having a lot of parents that are moving in and stuff like that. And then we're going to be stuck with structures that we can't use. And I think if we can tighten that language um, where we're not creating a separate apartment building, but giving some more, even additional flexibility. I think there's a win-win situation here. I just, I know in my situation, I've already, my family's made a commitment. At some point, we are going to have move-ins in my house. And I just want to have some flexibility on what I can do if, if I make any changes to my house. And my house is limited that there's no way I'm building another building on my lot. It's basically taking what we have existing and modifying inside the house. So I, I do think there might be some, maybe some controls where we could put in place that would address some of your concerns, but also give the, the homeowners flexibility that when they get in that situation where they're bringing in in-laws um, and relatives, especially seniors, and then those seniors pass on that they're not stuck with a house that they can't really do anything with uh, because they, they, they've modified it that way. So. 
So um, I hear you on that. I just think if you change it at the front end, you cannot help but incur those other what what we just talked about from happening. So um, I just think we need to be really careful when you when you allow that and understand what that means. So it's not just in our neighborhood. Um, I mean, there's several neighborhoods that I can think of that this would be a big problem in. And um, and again, you know, we're not talking the higher density zone or village zone. What I'm referring to is the low density residential where I, I do think this would be a problem. Yeah, I'm just thinking just more in her for us to revisit it. I'm not opposed to us approving what's we currently got written because it's making it simpler than what we got. But I can also commiserate with the, the condition, the concerns that have been raised at this point too. Uh, so one quick thing with the successory dwelling is I know we're trying to streamline the process, but is it maybe this is one of the things that we don't really want to streamline and we do want them to go to the zoning hearing board just so we have a little uh, input from them. So maybe even take it completely out of the um, streamlining process. Are you referring to the way it is currently being limited to a family member, or are you saying if there's changes made that allow it to be rented to or used by anybody, is are you breaking that apart, or are you saying keep it the way it is in the ordinance now via special exception approval? Yeah, so I'm saying what we're doing here is trying to streamline things to keep people out of the zoning hearing board. But maybe this is one of the things that we should actually not change, just have them continue to go to the zoning hearing board. Let me ask you a question. Do you have anything of a concern with what's in that current language in terms of running to, to family members? Not really, no. I mean, I can see what will happen is people will build the, build the thing and then at some point it's going to be empty and they're going to want to do something with it. So I think it's going to be hard to keep it limited to family members. But I think if we don't do that, then we could end up with double the density in some of our developments in theory. I think we might end up with a lot of them. I mean, it hasn't happened so far. Well, not that we know. Limited. There's actually it's, probably a lot of houses that have multiple people on them we don't know about. So. Yeah, if it's, yeah, I'm sure there are. Yes, I, that's, that's a tough one. Okay. Things that make it go. Yeah, it's definitely things that make it go. So, with that, if there's no more questions of the board, we'll open up to the audience. Mr. Kanar, you have to state your name, though. Kanar, one and nine Clover Circle. Um, I'm just voicing some of the same concerns that that Mr. Wigglesworth talked about. Um, I have big open space on my property, so um, accessory dwellings. I can only put like three bungalows. In the back, <laughs> but, but they won't be done until like March, uh, and they're all going to be occupied by family. But they're going to be. I came from New York, so you see a lot of these things. But by April, most of them are going to have to move out of state. So I'll be renting them to whoever shows up at my door. Is that the scenario that we're talking about, right? All right, now that wouldn't be permitted. That would be permitted. That would not be permitted. With what's thinking about doing. And, and I don't know, is accessory dwelling, you were headed that way, is an accessory dwelling one or can I put three? Uh, I have, that's, that, if put, we were, in my mind, if we were to loosen this up even more, we'd have to be pretty tight with what we're permitting. I mean, we're low density, but I'm just thinking there's plenty of room back there. And if, they, if they're not, it's not a primary dwelling, I could put at least three in there. You would still have your, your lot coverage requirements and things and controls that would be in place would still apply to your zone if you're, residential in, in nature, you could only, you know, cover a certain amount of your property to begin with. So um, there are those obvious controls in place too. And those, so. those three bungalows would be principal uses, right? You, yeah, I mean, you would you would look at that probably a little differently than you would this if, I mean, I don't think you could put three on there, but I mean, you're, you're changing the use from as defined to being principal buildings perhaps at that point. And that, that wouldn't fit the intent of what is existing in the ordinance or, or what's being shown here. But right now, we wouldn't be able to do the bungalows uh, with what's being proposed. But then Mr. Weaver's also correct. 
that somebody could move out and who's to be there to enforce it. But then that's gonna be honest with you, there's probably, we can go to a number of houses in the township right now that people have converted and have a family member or, or even a non-family member in there and we know nothing about it right now. That sounds like by exception, you're almost looking making to modify this so that it's a lot easier for that to happen. So that's just my concern. I see the same concern because some people will specifically do things to head down that path already. Like I'll build it now and mom moves in for a month and she's gone. So now I can start populating little pockets in you know, residential areas with just little houses. And I just, it would look really weird outside the back of my house if everybody started <laughs> putting little houses in there. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, thanks Fred. Anybody else? Yes. Colleen Jacobson, 2009 Chapel Porch Drive. I spoke to Nate the other day, great guy. Um, he, he faxed me over, I mean, fax, he emailed over the um, ordinance. And just going, let's just stay with the dwelling. Um, maybe you should have a deceased clause in the, <laughs> in, in, in the ordinance. I mean, as far as, you know, if, if the family member is deceased and there's no other family member that's going to be able to move into it, then what do you do? You know, like we were talking about. But um, do, are they going to be allowed to rent it? I mean, that's what we're talking about ultimately, right? Are they going to be allowed to rent it to someone else? Or is it going to sit there and deteriorate? Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an issue. But maybe we should put, you know, deceased clause in there. So that it's, it's in their face, you know, that if someone, you have to notify the township or whatever, whatever you're going to take it from there. But um, maybe a property size too, you know, well, it doesn't, it has to meet the property size, the property allowance for a dwelling, right? You would have to have a, a, a principal dwelling on the property to even be allowed to, to uh, use this. Right. Um, and right. then obviously we'll, if you're in a, RL zone, you would have to adhere to the established criteria, lot coverage, um, distance from property lines, all those kind of things would have to be met uh, when you brought in your plan for yeah. permit approval. I just, you know, from past experience of 20 years in insurance and reading insurance policies, the definition really makes a difference. I mean, if there's any ambiguous, ambigu ambiguousness in that definition, it goes to the, in insurance, it goes to the policyholder which it should, okay? And I think, you know, we have to be more conscious in defining things, but then we don't wanna be over-defining too. So we're kind of walking a tight line here. But I really think that um, we have to define things more. Um, you know, with the junkyard, um, I think that size of property, how many, maybe we should look at how many cars you're allowed to have on a certain size lot keep there repairing you know that's that's a, a thought to see because you know some people will have an acre or two acres and you know so I think maybe we should look at that and as far as the survey for people who have these repair places I think it should be a survey I think we should be proactive and working with them up front and saying what are your concerns what are your and have have us have a written survey and have Nate touch base with them, you know, as far as what their um, what their thoughts are on changing it or how they can how can do better. I don't know if anyone has ever watched a a um, episode of Hoarders, the Hoarders, <laughs> and it's always it, the episode always stems from the the municipality knocking on their door saying you got to clean it up or else you're out or else we condemn it. But I mean, it, that's what it is. I mean, it comes down to, you know, the municipality, you know, keeping it nice for the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, because that's, that's the key. You know, that's the key. Your neighbors are your neighbors and you don't want to mess with them, you know? So I think that we, if we police that in a way and present it like, you know, you wouldn't want this here if you were not involved in your business or, involved in, in, in repairing four cars at the same time. But I do think we should have some leniency right now because of 
of the supply chain. And um, it's, you know, it's, I don't know if it's going to get worse, things are going to change, but whatever. I think we should be a little more lenient in times of, of um, situations like we're in. Now, um, let me just look here a second. I see that on the, um, you're omitting crematoriums, right? Is that what you're doing in that? Adding a definition, I believe. If you look at page one, definition? right? on page one. Yeah. Yeah, that was, um, again, a note that, that was kind of out there to be added to any amendment that was to be done. So that definition was added again for the same idea that there's something to point to and, and you're defining, or East Hemfield is defining what that is. Okay. And the same with the funeral home um, definition, right? That's being amended. That exists. And the line that's underlined there, that text that uh, goes from page one to page uh Page two, that underlying text is additional text. That's just kind of, as you said earlier, trying to define that use maybe a little bit more clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, now the group home, is there a limit as to how many unrelated people can live in a dwelling? Like, right, and, and, and like, because, you know, you're taking away the license issue, which, you know, I guess the township shouldn't have to get involved whether this whether they're licensed, because it could it could be family members, <laughs> you know, that have dementia, you know, that that you're creating, you know, a couple of people. But I don't know if that is a tag along to our requirement as to how many family unrelated family members we're allowed to have in a in a household dwelling. A group no, home isn't. is Oak Oak Leaf Manor stuff like that. Excuse me. A group home is Oak Leaf Manor. Oh, things oh, okay. like that. Oh, okay. nursing nursing home, assisted living homes, those type of okay. facilities. And that's why the state's got some pretty heavy regulations that supersede our township regulations. You say, you know, when I think of group home, you know, sometimes it's just a normal home that they converted to a group home, like, you know, something like on, on Columbia Avenue, like, you know, um, if you make a left, there's a group home there. You know, but it's 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 not like it can't be in a dwelling. It can't be in a residential or residential area. It, it can be. I think I think what you're describing is is a condition as uh, what was um, added there as well. Um, these uses are regulated by the state, and I think again, what what was uh, done here was to just eliminate perhaps a step of that process that's already required. Um, by another agency. Um, again, I think your question about how many people can live in a home, that would come back to what, what type of dwelling is it? If it's a one family residence, then you, you couldn't have more right. than one okay. family. Um, so I think that, that again, is, is defined in there. Um, this use is unique, as, as you're describing, too. It's not, it's not as if it's the normal um, or what you would call normal kind of in, in a dwelling, it, it would be something that when you drive past, in essence, what this is, is you wouldn't know that that's a group home. It looks the same as everybody else's house, mm -hmm. but the state's controlling what's going on in there and the municipality is not allowed to regulate that in essence. So outside of what a regular home would, how that would be regulated already. So taking away the um, license part of it, I don't think you're taking it away. I believe they just don't have to provide that document to the zoning officer because it's already being done through state? the state. Yeah, I, I believe that was the intent. You yeah. hope, who's, who's checking? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, this, you gotta, you know. Um, First sentence does say a dwelling unit licensed to provide it. It does say the first sentence includes okay. license. Um, all right, a lot of the ordinance, you, you're eliminating personal communication devices. Um, what does that mean? I believe the intent there was that um, recent ordinance was approved to regulate um, small, cells. small cells. So I think this oh, was okay. just a cleanup from when that was done, that these were left over, I believe, in certain zones. So you'll see it crossed out in multiple areas. And again, that was a cleanup item because it's already being covered by another uh, part of the code. And what's the what's communication antenna and is that separate than towers or communication? And which one was that? Sorry. Um, I'm just saying in um, communication antenna and towers. Is that what you're referring to? I believe that's under the same category there that it 
there were zones where those uses were to be removed when the other ordinance was passed. And I think these were um, just kind of catch up that perhaps it wasn't removed. Uh, it, was a, it was more of an accidental outcome than on purpose. And now we're just going through and cleaning that up so it's clear. But what's, I know, I know towers are towers, but what's the, what's the communication antenna? What is, is that a requirement? I would believe that, that would be something attached to the tower. Um, I don't, I would assume that's all clearly defined within that small cell right. text, if you will, and yeah, would I'm have been saying. previously in, in this ordinance, if you will, okay. I believe now that's all treated under um, kind of its own. Because people own have dishes outside their houses on, you know, big ones sometimes that are, you know, communication devices, you know, they're not on top of the house, they're, you know, okay. for, di for um, cable or what have you. So, but that's defined though. Is that defined? The, um, I think that the communication antenna structure. was something that was on a structure. Okay. Okay. And the it, tower. it's wireless communication. It's not individual it's dishes. It's not cable or no. anything. No. Okay. Um, okay. So in the village residential zone, I guess, so you're eliminating I meant to, my question is, you're eliminating um, personal commun communication devices. Is that different than? That, that was the same one I think we, we just spoke about, that that is, again, a cleanup item that if, um, when that other ordinance was passed, I believe the thought was that you're just um, duplicating what you already control in another part of the code. And I think that was part of the effort that we talked about to kind of kind of clear it up and just make sure that there's no misinterpretation of what the intent was there as prior to that last ordinance amendment or the adoption of that, those uses, that's how these uses were being constructed or um, put in place was via this text. Okay. So to have it duplicated perhaps could be confusing. And I think the effort here is to clear that up. And again, you'll see that as a strike through in almost every one of these, just because it wasn't done when the other uh, amendment was processed. Okay, so um, in that section, is that village residential zone, are you you eliminating assisted living facilities completely? Um, community rehab facilities. Um, is that is that what I'm reading? When you say eliminating it completely, it, that it it's being, a through. That's it's, why I it's it's being removed from the zone, but it's right. it's still permitted in the township. It's just not permitted here. In its own. You got it. Yeah. Right. And that was one of the things we spoke about. I think the county brought up it was uh, through review with multiple parties. It was just deemed that perhaps these uses aren't compatible with what's surrounding them. What what zones are they allowed in? Uh, the community rehab is within the enterprise. The assisted living, I'd have to double check that for you. I don't I don't have that okay. uh, right in front of me here. I would assume it would it would be in in an, a zone like that, like an enterprise or um, a campus, perhaps. Okay. Now the, um, in the same zone, the minimum setbacks for principal uses. Mm -hmm. Now you have, is that changed? No, it's just okay. an error in the, the reference. It's referring to something that doesn't exist. Okay. So it's just clarifying for everybody's benefit there that that uh, E3A is in the existing code. The reference to it just says uh, E, I think it says E2, okay. which is not uh, the right section reference. Okay. Now I read this the other night, don't just, I have a, a note here about um, rural business zone um, schools, accessory dwelling units added. We added accessory dwelling units in that rural business zone. Business. No, it's just being changed from special exception to permitted use. And then, um, what about the motor vehicle sales, leasing, and service? Is that That's the same. It's just being changed from a zoning hearing board uh, approval to a staff approval with some of the criteria that we talked about uh, earlier. So there are a few extra conditions to allow that to be used, um, protections, if you will, that would have been imposed by a zoning hearing board is now a part of a permit review. Okay. Um, All right, in the village center zones, you have accessory and bar, accessory dwellings and bar and taverns. Is that? Um, so again, those are existing uses in the zone that would be permitted by a special exception process. They're both being um, 
moved, if you will, to being permitted by right via a permit. And then in the later part of the ordinance, you'll see those uses reappear. And that's just adding text to those as additional criteria, um, some of, of which we already spoke about that are being added to it to bring in some of the comments that the zoning hearing board uh, was adding to the approvals that they felt like the use is okay as long as you comply with this. And that's where some of that text is coming from. Now, um, on the community business zone, you have home-based business impact. What is that re referring to? So I believe on this one, there was a mistake in the current ordinance that was permitting that by right, whereas the home-based business, no impact, meaning that, again, you would drive by a place and not know they're operating a business there. That's permitted by right in every zone. This one, that impact was included in the permitted uses by mistake in the past, and it was being pulled out to match that same use in other zones where you would need to go um, before the zoning hearing board to gain approval. So it's not, it is being shown with a line through it, but like the other ones we spoke about, if, okay. if you look under it, it's being proposed again, just in a different right. uh, capacity. Okay. So there, that use is impactful to neighbors, which would require them to get approval or have the ability to have their neighbors be party to an application. Okay. Now in that, in the community business zone, are you adding nightclubs or no, that's another That's the same, it's same just issue. it's just being altered in, okay. in the way in which it's approved. And again, there'll be text at the end that is, is being added to um, add those typical conditions of approval that we're seeing. It's the same thing with the, with the um, um, regional com commerce zone, commerce center zone. Um, regional commerce. So that's the one I think we just spoke about with the home-based business impact and the nightclubs. Those are both shown. As they were both the community business and that is the same issue then. Because there's two of them right after each other, section nine and ten. Yeah, so that that uh, the 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 reference in there, yeah, like it's it's a strike through, but it's then shown again as proposed text, which is uh, changing the way the use is permitted. If that's a better way to explain okay, those, so it's just showing that it's it's currently permitted via a process, and perhaps now it's permitted by right or by a. Sony hearing board review rather than perhaps a conditional use or a supervisor's review. So you're, you're lessening the restrictions to the owner that's doing that? Is that the intent is mm -hmm. to make it easier. Um, I think on a few of these, it was deemed that perhaps the zoning hearing board with their review process by nature is better suited to review a few of these. So instead of it being a conditional use coming to this board, it would go to that board for their review. Other cases it's being taken from the zoning hearing board utilizing their common conditions and then making it a review by by Nate that you spoke about earlier, basically, or the zoning officer. Okay. Now the village um, zone. Okay, any question I have? Yeah. And which Only, one was, is that? VR or VC? VR. VR. Okay. Only allowing accessory dwelling units. Again, this isn't this isn't a complete list of what's permitted. It's just okay. it's just that it's like if you came in, you'd have to go to zoning hearing board. Now you're what, getting I a don't permit. Have a thing to yeah, do no, that's fine. So. Yeah, it's just uh, um, it's 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 not changing and or eliminating. It's just moving. In the campus zone, I saw somewhere where you you're eliminating education schools or somewhere. Um, I'm just remember seeing that. I okay. think maybe what you're referring to is under the rural business zone um, I can there is a I think it's not being eliminated again it's it's just being permitted that um, the, you know a school wouldn't have to come through for various approvals through the zoning hearing board it's just a permit process and I believe there the intent was more where it's located you would have some smaller lots and perhaps some um, non-traditional schools Ms. Jacobs just to kind of speed things up I mean the, yeah, the, I'm the, sorry. the intent of this is we're not really eliminating things. We're just moving where the responsibilities are. Okay. Any things that were new were the things that Miss Wills brought up with the chunk yard and a couple of those things. The rest of this is more just, it's just more gonna be clean up of stuff. Right. And like like our engineer said, it's gonna be for most part pulling a lot of these out of the zoning hearing board and allowing the township to approve it, which streams on the process for the, mm -hmm. the resident of the business. There are one or two that were actually being kicked into the zoning hearing board. Uh, but those were already gone through a process where we would have done a conditional use, which you said before. Right, right. Okay. 
And so we're basically just moving that to the zoning hearing board, but that's usually for development and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These are the bigger things that would be occurring that would be getting what's called a special exception, which is replacing what was have been a conditional use hearing. Mm -hmm. So, but we're really not adding or removing things. It's just more of where the approvals are going to be. And for the most okay. part, it's moving stuff out of the zoning hearing board's purview and coming into okay. the township's purview for approval. That's good. That's better for the residents. Um, <laughs> I think, but really get into the de definitions, you know, because you need to like get into that because that's going to be an issue, I think, especially with that family thing. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Any more questions from the audience? Okay. So at this point, we, the board, it sounds like, and I can check with the board, but it sounds like a number of us have some questions that been raised by the hearing. Um, so in the past, this is a procedural question, we would close the hearing, but there's no, there's nothing on this situation that requires us to take action within any time clock, like it would be for a zoning application or something like that. Right. So I, I would recommend you close your hearing tonight. I think at this point, you have to decide whether you want to adopt the ordinance as proposed tonight, whether you want to send it back to staff or perhaps um, re further review, further refining, um, and depending on the extent of those and nature of those changes, you may need to go back through planning commissions. For example, if you are gonna take away uh, the, the family requirement with an accessory dwelling, you probably wanna put that through review again. So for the 60 day thing that got brought up too for the, mm -hmm. the maintenance operations. Right, I mean, I think it's just gonna depend on, you know, how extensive your revisions are going to be. Um, you know, if you were going to sit here tonight and say we're going to change 60 days to 90 days, you're okay, I think, to proceed um, with adopting it with that revision. So it, it really just depends on the extent of the revisions you want to make. You've covered a couple different topics tonight that I think, you know, right. if you're going to address all of them. <laughs> all right. So we, we close the hearing, but we don't need to take any action on this tonight. We don't need no, to do table, not. don't need to do anything at this point. No. Uh, so I think what we'll do first, and the board's willing, I'll entertain a motion that we close the hearing. So moved. Okay, a motion from Mr. Bent. Do I hear a second? Second. Second from Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Willsworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye, the ayes have it. So we, we have closed the hearing. Now we can just have a discussion with the board at this point. Now the hearing's closed. Um, it does not, and maybe I'm wrong if anybody's willing to take action tonight, but it doesn't sound like the board's ready to take action on this tonight. Rather not. Okay. And we could just refer this back to the planning working group and take in some of the comments that were received and then come back to the board. So this obviously be something that would be taken on the beginning of next year come back to the board for the planning working group and the staff with a recommendation, um, whether we're going to make changes to the ordinance or not, or just make some recommendations in general. Would that be legally compliant? Yes, that would okay. be fair. Is that uh, just a nod of the heads? Is everybody kind of in agreement with that? Yes. Yep. I appreciate the work the planning committee has done on this. I mean, this is a, a tough uh, job and uh, to do a comprehensive rehab, right? But uh, yeah, I think if we wait, I think we're in good shape. Um, I mean, we were working on it pretty intensively. It, yeah. It's still, if we have a fresh set of eyes, you got a different perspective on things. So it's whenever we make a change to our, our ordinances that are significant, it, it usually sometimes it takes two or three tries uh, to kind of get things right. So, so with that, we're there's no action to take. And so we will move on to our Next agenda item, and this is actually important, um, and we'll let Ms. Schweitzer explain this, but this is a request to add to the agenda, and this is a resolution to become part of the statewide opioid settlement. There is a time-sensitive nature to this request, so Ms. Schweitzer. So I'm asking you to add a resolution to be part of the statewide opioid settlement. Um, this is a settlement that deals with several um, pharmaceuticals, and um, it is time sensitive. Um, we need to submit the paperwork in time. It does have ramifications at the county level. They are to receive the funding and then it gets distributed to things that will curtail or control drug abuse. 
So it, it's a very good um, thing to be doing. It's significant dollars if the larger municipalities join in this, this settlement um, to, in, to the tune of millions of dollars to the county. Okay, just one quick question. We don't need stenographer. We do not. Okay. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> as much as we like you taking our meeting minutes at this point, I think we're good at this point. So. <laughs> You're off the hook. Yep, no, I'm stood. So is any any questions about this at this point? It is time sensitive. We got to get it back before a reorg meeting. Although we were told we could go into a reorg meeting, our understanding is it needs to be back in the first week of January. And so the county solicitor has been reaching out, asking the municipalities to promptly adopt this. And if this was something that came up for from the state, pretty darn quick to everybody at this point. I believe Conlia took care of it last night. It is on the city's agenda, so it's moving through the process. If there's no question of the board, I'll entertain a motion that we add this to the agenda. So moved. Okay, motion from Mr. Regelsworth. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Uh, next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. The purpose of the consent agenda is to approve routine items that usually require very little debate or discussion. And with that, I will open it up to the consent agenda. there any discussion then? I, I do have one though that I just wanna add on the record. Um, I would like a one part of the meeting minutes change from our last meeting. Um, there's just a little bit of a liability issue to this. I would like it on the record that Mr. Reichel PE responded. Um, this is after the questions about safety were brought up uh, in his professional opinion, certifying that the billboard was properly designed and safely located meeting industry standards and township setback requirements. And that he also stated he would not professionally see a plan that wasn't safe. So if there's no objections to that, I would like to add to the agenda. Yep. Okay, any other questions at this point? Is there any reason why I should not be improving invoices tonight? No, there's not. Okay. So with that, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as discussed. So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Weaver, is there a second? Second. Second for Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye, the ayes have it for nothing. Next, we'll move on to our action items. Um, we already took care of the first item, which was the approval of the liquor license. And the second item, that's the zoning is the zoning ordinance amendment. Thank you. Um, and we don't have our solicitor here now. We got to have it as an actual action item on our agenda. Do we have to table or do we? I think you should probably table. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to table. So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Bennett. Is there a second? Second. Second from Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Next up, we have Mavis Tire, 1655 Columbia Avenue and Princeton Avenue, modification and final plan. So, so I believe Mr. Uh, Le All right. I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Larry from Solely Engineering is on Zoom. And I think we also have a map that we can pull up. Larry, can you hear us? <laughs> um. Hold on. Pull up the map um, showing the, the project. That way you can kind of. Floor is yours. Okay, perfect. I think that was born. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, the question was, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So um, we, we didn't have a very good presentation, but uh, referring to the, the Avis uh, uh, on uh, uh, the Columbia Avenue, uh, currently is a, yeah, uh, uh, um, and uh, 
let me start at the beginning. My name is Larry. I'm a licensed uh, Geneva, a number of states, uh, uh, one of which is Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm running uh, solely and the uh, the and uh, the AMA Realtors LLC. And just as a notice here, so you don't think I'm mispronouncing, I believe the people in Jersey just pronounce Lancaster a little different. Like some Lancaster kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if there's something you can do on your end, but you're not coming through very well. Larry, 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 we're having problems hearing uh, yeah. I think you have a bad data connection. Could you turn off your video to see if they'll improve your audio, please? Because you're, you're, you're breaking it. We're getting a better problem with the audio. I'm going to call on the I'm going to call in. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, while he's calling in, is there anything our township engineer wants to say? Sure, I think Does this is, speed the process up. Yeah, this project has, has been uh, reviewed multiple times. Uh, currently, uh, as I think he stated, the existing site is, is vacant. The um, friendly's restaurant was in that place beforehand. Um, the site is is existing, the lot's existing. It is a bit restrictive to what they can and can't do there. So there are a number of modification requests that came through. We worked with them and staff worked with them to kind of achieve a happy outcome here. Um, I think with the plan, the currently, um, the November 29th revision date, on the, that plan set appears to, to be on track for a good project. Um, they've worked through multiple issues. They have, they were, uh, denied access to Columbia Avenue from PennDOT. So they've gone through multiple iterations of this that typically we wouldn't see it come back that many times, but it was imposed upon them and they did their best to comply with what they could and where they couldn't, they asked for relief, which as our letter states, we didn't see that being out of the ordinary for the site being what it is. Um, and there's, there's nothing in this letter I don't think that they couldn't comply with from here on out. And again, they've been through the process uh, multiple times just because of the change to the site design and layout. Nice, uh, in a way, brownfield redevelopment of a Got site it. that's been vacant. Correct. And they've, again, the plan that they came in originally was going to go forward, then could not due to PennDOT. So again, the changes made did add relief requests, but they do not appear to be out of line for that change. Plus the existing site, as you said, is, is uh, restrictive in nature. Now we're waiting on the engineer. Any questions for our engineer? Can we maybe table this and move on to some other things? I think we just got him. Long. Is there anything at this point after hearing our engineer's presentation that would give you doubt to approve this? No. No, I don't. Okay, then maybe yeah, I, I appreciate our the applicant's engineer, but how about we just keep this one moving and I'll read the motions. So the first motion. I, I, just, I just got on if, if that matters. Um, Larry LaPierre. I think we're good at this point. Um, our engineer, while you were getting hooked up, uh, kind of gave us a good overview. <laughs> good job, yeah, once again, I did a fabulous job. It's redevelopment. That's what we like to hear when a vacant site gets redeveloped. That's a good thing at this point. Larry, is there anything on the DMA letter that you're not willing to comply with? No. Okay. There you go. Okay. So uh, the first motion is to approve modification request number one, number two, number three, number four, number seven, number 10, and number 11. And recommend conditional approval of modification request number five, number six, number eight, and number nine for the Mavis Discount Tire Final Land Development Plan, Township File 2117-02, subject to staff and engineer comments. So do I hear a motion? So moved. Okay, motion for Mr. Bennett. Do I hear a second? Second for Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. 
Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it. Five nothing. Next up is motion to approve the final land development plan for Mavis Discount Tire Township File Number 21-17.01, condition on the applicant addressing all staff and engineer comments within 90 days of Board of Supervisor approval, or the plan will be null and void. So do I hear a motion? So moved. Let me go to Mr. Bent. Do I hear a second? Second. Second from Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. So there you go. Thank you for uh, your 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 uh, client coming in and taking over that. Uh, being, uh, it's appreciated. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Uh, enjoy the holiday. Thank you. You too. So next up, we have another thing that we had discussed. It's pen dot signature on resolution 2021-52, authorizing the signature on the sidewalk maintenance agreement for Church Street. Ms. Swayzer. So we already adopted the agreement for the sidewalk on Church Street. And I neglected to add the resolution that PennDOT always requires for signature, which is what this is. It simply authorizes the signature on the agreement. So is there any discussion of the boards as we already approved this? This is more of a technicality. So then I will entertain a motion to sign resolution 21-25-52 to authorize signature on the sidewalk maintenance agreement for Church Street. So do I hear a motion? So moved. Motion from Mr. Wigglesworth. Do I hear a second? Second. Second from Mr. Weaver. Ms. Spicer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it five or four to nothing. Next up, we have the Centerville Road widening the agreement between the township and Northern Southern for the railroad crossing widening and improvements. Ms. Spicer. So this is one of the, those agreements that is part of the Centerville Road widening. It's between the township and Norfolk Southern. We are widening, widening the crossing there on Centerville Road. Um, we hold the contracts for this project for the township portion, which includes the crossing. And this is agreement with Norfolk Southern uh, outlining reimbursement requirements, uh, payment requirements, insurance requirements, to, so that uh, Norfolk Southern is assured that this project will be done to their standards. It's been reviewed by our attorney. Uh, she is fine with it. It's also been um, looked at by our. I'm assuming your town, the uh, PennDOT engineer looked at this too. PennDOT engineer, yes. So, pretty much a lot of a lot of standard language. How many more agreements do we got left at this point? Or is this one the last one for Centerville? It's actually one of the first ones. First one. Yes, we do not have a construction agreement yet with PennDOT. Now, how many more property ag agreements at this point? Do we have anything else outstanding besides right this away. one for right away? Anything at this point? What do we have outstanding? So, or just ballpark what we have outstanding? The only thing we have outstanding, the right away plan is closed. Right. The only thing we have outstanding is giving right away back to three properties: Belco Credit Union, um, Sycamore Court, and that Fish Place. Okay. There, all the other takings are are taken care of or completed. At least and to the point of putting them into the courts. We don't have any other utility agreements at this point that need signed. No. Northbrook Southern was really the last one in terms of a major agreement. I don't know if it's the last one. Okay. It's the first one. I don't think we have any other utility agreements on this project yet. Okay. So we got utilities, we got right away, we got the railroad crossings, and now it's just the pen dollar agreement. Right. With this going out to, to let in the winter, that's what I was asking. They are working very carefully to get this accomplished by January for the bed letting. Yes. Okay. Any other questions of the board? Anybody from the audience on this one? Okay. Seeing none, entertain a motion to approve the agreement between the township and Norfolk Southern Railroad, which outlines reimbursements of costs associated with the Centerville Road winding project. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Motion, Mr. Bennett. Do I hear a second? Second from the chair, Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Next up, we have the Old Worristown Road Bridge, engineer's request for a time extension. Ms. Schweitzer? So we have a contract with McCormick Taylor for uh, replacement of the Old Worristown Road Bridge. This project has been floating around for probably 10, 15 years. Um, McCormick Taylor is at the very end of this project. 
They are now loading documents into the PennDOT uh, tracking system. So we're moving forward rather quickly at this point, but their contract expires the end of the year. So they're asking for an extension of time until August 31 of 22. And this was uh, reviewed by PennDOT at this point? Yes. This was something that was uh, requested by PennDOT to uh, close the loop on their progress. And PennDOT's paying 95% of the bill? That's correct. We pay 2.5 of the bill and Mannheim pays the other 2.5. Okay. Any other discussions by the board? Anybody from the audience? Seeing none. I'll entertain a motion to grant a contract time extension to McCormick Taylor to August 31st, 2022 for the Old Rare Sound Bridge Project. Do I hear a motion? No motion. Motion, Mr. Weaver, do I hear a second? Second. Second for Mr. Bennett. Ms. Weiser, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it forward, nothing. Next up, we have the 2022 meeting schedule, Ms. Weiser. So I just put before you the 2022 meeting schedule. It includes the Board of Supervisors, the Planning Commission, the Recreation Authority, and the Zoning Hearing Board. I did not include the Fire Services Commission because their meetings have not been set for next year. And I was requested by the Industrial Development Authority not to include theirs as well. So we're starting uh, the year off on June, Monday, June 3rd, no, sorry, June, January 3rd for our reorganizational meeting, which will be our first meeting for January. That starts at 4.30. The other odd meeting is the budget meeting in October the end of October, which also starts at 4.30. The rest of the meetings will start at seven. It also does not include a meeting for the first meeting that would have been in July because of vacation schedules. Okay, same as our before any discussion of the board. Okay, so I will entertain a motion to set the 2022 meeting schedule as presented. So moved. Motion for Mr. Wigglesworth, do I hear a second? Second. Second for Mr. Bennett. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Next up, we have the 2022 non uniform employee holiday schedule. Ms. Schweitzer? So this is the typical uh, holiday schedule that you have approved in the past. It's nine holidays, four personal days for the non uniform employees. Uh, again, no change from the way we've been doing business. Correct. So any discussion of the board? Okay, I'll entertain a motion to set the 2022 non-uniform employee holiday schedule as presented. So moved. Uh, motion for Mr. Bennett, second for Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth? Aye. Mr. Russell? Aye, the ayes have for nothing. And the last thing is our, what was just added to our agenda, resolution 2021-53, the statewide Opioid Settlement Resolution, Ms. Schweitzer. So as I it, uh, indicated before, it is something that uh, is important for the larger municipalities to do. It does impact the amount of money funds that will be received by the county. The funds that are gonna be received by the county are to be used for drug, uh, I don't wanna say improvements, uh, reduce the drug use. It's ready to opioid issues. Thank you. It's also a potential, and I, I can say this publicly, it's a potential funding source for the drug task force going forward. Uh, so this has got uh, some pretty big ramifications and every, every major municipalities, that's all the municipalities of where what the population size was. 10,000. 10,000 above in the, in the county all have to adopt this unanimously for the county to get the money. So that's why they're this book that was added onto the agenda as a, a rush item at this point. So. It's a make or break if uh, we want to get the monies in for the county for this. And we're talking an excess of just under a million dollars a year. So it's a pretty significant number. And it has to go to directly to opioid related items, the drug task force treatment, uh, Narcan, things like that. It's going to be what it goes to. So it's a very good deal, very good settlement. It was a bipartisan lawsuit between led by Texas and Pennsylvania. So. This was both a Republican and a Democrat issue. Wait, you got to come, come on forward. Colleen Jacobson, 2009, Chapel Cliff Drive. Is it costing us any money? Like when we 
say, okay, we want some of the settlement. Will we get a portion of the bill, legal bills? No, we're not getting, I, I, I'm sure the lawyers in this play, case were not being charitable. I'm sure they're getting, they're cutting the fee, <laughs> um, which we're talking about billions of dollars are probably going to one law firm. Um, but it is, it, it basically is a, is a legal settlement. It's just kind of like the tobacco settlement from years ago. Okay. It will go in, but this one has got some unique strings to it. Um, the way the settlement was written has to be targeted towards things that are related to the opioid crisis. So the drug task force would be a qualifying expense. Um, building a new prison for the county would probably be a harder stretch. Uh, paving East Hempfield Towns up roads would not qualify. Uh, so it, it has to be something that's directly related to the opioid issues. The drug task force, like I said, Narcan, uh, EMS response uh, for overdoses um, and some of the expenses to go along with that would be something that'd be eligible. Some police costs would be eligible. So there's, there, they'd have to figure it out, but the biggest one would actually be drug task force and basically support things like rehab programs, stuff like that, that help address the issue too. Now, what about the school district? Would they get some of it through the, maybe the police department in the way they have I programs for that? I won't answer right, right now. We don't know the, the details yet. The devil's in the okay. details. All we know is if we don't do this step, right, we right. could put the county gain the money in jeopardy. All right, great, thanks. Any more questions at this point? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adopt resolution 2021-53 as discussed. So do I hear a motion? So moved. Motion from Mr. Wigglesworth. Do I hear a second? Se second from Mr. Weaver. Ms. Schweitzer, please pull the board. Mr. Weaver. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Wigglesworth. Aye. Mr. Russell. Aye. The ayes have it for nothing. Next, we will move on to old business. Is there any old business that wasn't covered? Okay. Next, any new business? And then we'll turn it over to the traffic commission report. Would that be Mr. Bennett? Yes, traffic commission met this evening at six o'clock um, where we reviewed and confirmed our minutes from November the 17th. We also took the chief's uh, traffic report and summary uh, that detailed a number of uh, actions that were taken in, in the uh, township by, or were at, at six or seven um, locations. Um, we also talked about and discussed a uh, change to the pedestrian signal timing at Good Drive and Knoll Road. Uh, we're asking uh, for McMahon to evaluate that. Um, we closed the books on four traffic studies, Indian Springs, Main Street, Marietta Avenue, and Stony Battery Road. Uh, discussed all four of those and uh, had public comment. Okay, thank you. Ms. Schweitzer, manager's report. So a lot of the projects really don't have any updates at this point. Um, I will go th over Old Georgetown Road Bridge. As I indicated earlier, uh, McCormick Taylor is loading a lot of documents into the PennDOT management system. So that project is scheduled to be let in February of next year. So that's a very good news. Um, the rest of the projects, there's, there's really nothing going on. Uh, just moving through some of the paperwork regarding some of the grants that we have gotten. Uh, the, we're in the process of doing the 2021 employee evaluations. So those are being worked on. The, in terms of group reports, we had a public safety working group. We discussed the body-worn cameras, which are now fully deployed and working. And the police department is working on filling the police vacancy. That was uh, uh, notification came last month. We are also awaiting the formal decision on accreditation, which will be due in March of uh, 2022. That organization only meets on a quarterly basis, so we have to wait a few months to officially find out if our accreditation was approved, but you're pretty confident, if not knowing that. Formality group. Yes, there you go. Uh, we also discussed a hotel ordinance, 
which uh, will be drafted to require hotels to get and maintain ID records on rentals that they, that they uh, do. It's something that's going to hopefully curtail uh, trafficking issues related to the rentals of those units. If um, people know who is renting the unit with the ID, it hopefully will curtail some of that. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Okay. Um, we also discussed the request of East Pete Borough to revisit the fire department apparatus funding. Staff will be working on an addendum to that, addendum to that agreement. The admin finance group met uh, a day or so ago. The group supports the idea of using a portion of the unused 22 budget wage funding to provide market adjustments to several non-uniformed employees. Uh, the policy statement that the board will be asked to approve the use of ARPA funds for projects in the township. We had discussed that uh, before. What I'd like to do is develop a policy that the pro those projects come back to the Board of Supervisors for approval to use that money. So we keep track of it and it gets it into the public eye of what we're using those funds for. So that will be coming to you in, in uh, January. We did discuss a couple of projects of that will be used, that will be first in that list is the 75,000 for the blue green corridor, which is related to stormwater, $11,000 for meeting room projectors and 15,000 for AED, AED replacements. LIMC and legislative leaders held a meeting almost back to back on the same day. Commissioner D'Agostino discussed with the LIMC group the importance of this class action suit regarding the opioid settlement. The municipalities over 10K of residents will affect how much the county can receive in the settlement offer. So that, that's actually on your agenda tonight, taken care of. Also discussed, and I hate to bring it up, but trick or treat. <laughs> Not looking for options tonight. We have some time, but the LIMC is looking for some direction. They suggested five, four options, keep it as is, all trick or treat on Halloween, trick or treat on Halloween with built in weather delay or LIMC out of the Halloween business altogether. I voted for number four, but we didn't vote yet. Um, so that's gonna be on your board agenda for some time before the next LIMC meeting, which is in February. Okay. Um, just to get me some feedback on what direction you wanna head with that. Um, also discussed primarily in the legislative leaders meeting was the radar bill, which is stuck in appropriations. Uh, they don't feel that that's gonna move forward at all because of the election year. Columbia Borough would like to initiate efforts to make all codes the same. Uh, they have particularly a problem with the requirement for civil service and the hiring of uh, police officers. They feel they're at a disadvantage. So they're gonna be promoting that. The fireworks bill, there was a joint hearing held this week, I believe this morning actually, between the House and the Senate to discuss a potential bill to modify that. And also being promoted by Representative Miller is an advertising requirement, which is an archaic standard. And Representative Miller's bill uh, will allow a municipality to submit ads to the newspaper and make that effort. If for some reason they would fail to advertise, then we would be considered complying if we had posted it on our website or a Facebook page or something of that nature. So he's hoping that that angle will hopefully get some traction and could be approved. That's related to LMP's issue when they got ransomware and they couldn't run ads. Correct. And a whole bunch of municipalities were Caused in a position problems. of having deemed approvals because they couldn't advertise. Correct. Uh, the planning report, uh, the sign ordinance amendment should be finalized hopefully by Friday and a draft will be distributed to the board to look at. This will also include the Penn dot and not Penn dot, Penn State signage package and, and those affiliated uh, requirements. Uh, the Nolt Road cluster development is still under engineering review as well as the Shriver Pediatric on Community Way and also Woodcrest Villa phase four. U-Haul zoning, we just received the text amendment petition for that zoning. It will be on your uh, January 3rd agenda for acknowledgement so that that can go through the review process. 
and that was for the 13 acres off of State Road. 2727 Columbia Avenue rezoning is moving for the, the PC review process as well. Uh, lastly, 5100 Main Street, Main Realty LP, which is the Frank Nolt property. Mr. Nolt back in 19 or 2016 approached the board about a bypass lane on Commercial Avenue. He never built it, but he did get approval. He has the agreements for that in place. So that was just issued in case you see some activity over there. That's what's going on. And that concludes the report, unless you have questions. Any questions for the manager? I would just um, add to for the working group um, on December 3rd, uh, Chairman Russell and myself met with East Petersburg Borough here at uh, East Hempfield Township, nine o'clock. The meeting lasted for approximately half an hour. The discussion was of the um, a framework for a um, cost sharing agreement for apparatus for the volunteer fire department and classify the meeting as um, productive and, and uh, clarified uh, um, an issue that had uh, been a sticking point. Um, moving forward in that working group, uh, the staff is going to begin uh, to revisit um, looking at uh, cost sharing between East Petersburg Borough and um, East Hempfield moving forward. So there's a lot to uh, that agreement and in our working group, um, a lot of items were, valid items were brought up um, for discussion. So whoever's on that working group next year uh, is gonna have a lot of work to do uh, with that. Um, and a lot, I think, Ultimately, this board's going to have to agree upon um, moving moving forward. So, I don't know that it's a clear cut and dry, uh, easy solution. Um, and I, you know, I do have some concerns uh, with it going forward uh, with the borough. Uh, but again, I think um, let staff do their work and uh, come back to us next year with it and uh, take a look at it and um, you know, see if it's something we can agree with. Just there anything admin finance? We also talked about approaching PennDOT for some revisiting of the uh, funding for Centerville Road, uh, like we did with uh, Old Town Road and State Road Interchange, uh, to see if we can get a change to the 80 20 split. Uh, that would be a little bit more favorable to the township. Um, that's our biggest drain of the capital reserve fund for the next couple of years, and might be the difference between having to float a bond or not having to float a bond. Uh, there's a little homework over the holidays. One last thing. I also would request an executive session to discuss a personnel matter. Tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yes, tonight. Short. <laughs> okay, so with that, we are going to move on to public comment. Is there any public comment? Thank the public for staying through the first half of our meeting. So thank you. Okay, seeing none. Then it is 9.10. We are going to adjourn the meeting, go into the executive session where we will take no action. So with that, we're going to adjourn the meeting.